Every Space Marine Legion was composed of tough, hardened warriors, trained to fight against any foe on almost any battlefield. However, one Legion took this to the extreme, their endurance becoming somewhat legendary. Their Primarch was raised on a toxic world, and his sons would come to not only survive in this inhospitable environment, but turn the worst of it against their enemies. Renowned and feared in the Great Crusade, the Legion turned traitor during the Horus Heresy and ultimately fell into the clutches of Chaos, as the god Nurgle took their greatest strength and turned it against them. Unlike many traitor legions, they are still reasonably unified even in the modern era, and frequently enter the material realm to spread the gifts of their patron. Led by the Primarch Mortarion, also known as the Death Lord, they were the 14th Legion of Startes from the virulent planet of Barbarus. Once known as the Dusk Raiders, they are the Death Guard, and this is their story. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to Legions, a 40k stories miniseries. The 14th Legion were founded early in the Unification Wars, with their initial recruits drawn from the region of Albia. Even in these earliest of days, one could easily see what would become the defining traits of the Legion begin to emerge. The nascent 14th were masters of endurance, relentless in attack and implacable in defence, often taking the role of heavy infantry when called to war. They were given the moniker Dusk Raiders by their enemies, as they often attacked just as night began to fall, and it became the Legion's adopted name before too long. They also borrowed something else from their enemies, this time in their colour scheme. Albia had often fought a region known as the Pan-Pacific Empire, led by a ruler called the Unspeakable King, who used the bloodied right hand as a symbol of his power and reach. Whilst Dusk Raider armour as a whole was unpainted, the Legion adopted this symbol after the Unspeakable King's defeat, proclaiming in a way that they were the Emperor's red right hand of justice in the Unification Wars. Once Terra had been brought into line and the Great Crusade began, the Dusk Raiders carried on much as they had on the Cradle of Humanity. Their night raids became so feared that many enemies simply surrendered rather than try and fight the 14th. Legion composition was very standardised, with almost no variation from usual, although it is noted they preferred short-ranged weapons and attrition-heavy combats, perhaps more than some other legions. Unfortunately, despite the fact that they fought in this way for the best part of 80 years, very little is known of what the 14th actually got up to in this period. There are no known major conflicts involving the Dusk Raiders post-unification wars, though I'm sure they kept themselves plenty occupied on numerous campaigns. My theory as to why so much has been forgotten or lost is due to the traditions instilled following the return of the Legion's Primarch. The new Astartes were not particularly fond of the old hands from Terra, and neither was the Primarch if we're being honest, as he wiped away almost all the old traditions of the Legion. This might help explain why legionary records before the Primarch's coming were forgotten, either they were expunged or simply abandoned, but the only reason why the Imperium as a whole could have forgotten would have to be because of the Legion's eventual fate. Whatever the case, eventually those 80 years of fatherless war ended for the Dusk Raiders as the Great Crusade arrived at Barbarus. Down on that toxic planet, they found the 13th of the Emperor's lost sons, Mortarion, the Death Lord. Mortarion landed in an area of Barbarus no regular human could have survived in due to its noxious air. There he was found by what is believed to have been a Xenos or some mutated human thing, one of the overlords of Barbarus who would hunt the feral humans for pleasure. Rather than kill the infant Primarch, the Overlord adopted and trained him, naming him Mortarion, or Child of Death. Like all Primarchs, Mortarion was a prodigy, absorbing vast amounts of information on all subjects, but there was one test even he could not pass. His adopted father had decided to train Mortarion at the most toxic place the Primarch could survive in, and then established his own fortress higher on the mountains where his son could not reach. Rule of thumb on Barbarus, the air got worse the higher you went. Eventually, after a period of education and assumedly conflict against any enemies of his father, though deliberately not against the humans for perhaps obvious reasons, Mortarion wished to know what lay beyond the toxic miasma he called home, down at the base of the valleys. Despite, or perhaps thanks to the warnings of his father not to go, the Primarch descended the hills and found the human populace, horrified to learn that these were his kin, not whatever his father was. Now he was effectively in exile, but Mortarion was content with that, and resolved to help the humans however he could. He was distrusted for a long time despite his age due to his gaunt appearance, towering size, and the fact that he'd come from the fog where no one could hope to live, but the local opinion skyrocketed once the overlords returned. A lesser lord had come to hunt, but Mortarion intervened and chased it into the fog, striking it down with his handcrafted scythe. From then on, 
Multarian was seen as a symbol of hope, a prophet despite his grim demeanour, and thanks to his knowledge of technology and the inability of the overlords to unite, he and the humans pushed back. It took decades, but as new respirator units and armour were developed, the tide swung inexorably toward the humans. The first Death Guard were also formed at this time. The title was given by Multarian to his human armies, armoured in full plate with advanced respirators the Primarch himself developed to enable survival in the otherwise lethal fog. Eventually, only Multarian's former father remained, his home too high for the technology or the Primarch to survive, despite all of their efforts. It was at this time that the Great Crusade arrived, and the Emperor came to Barbarus as Multarian returned from his first failed attack. The Lord of Mankind and his son did not get on, as far as history records, primarily because the Death Lord was angry at or resentful of the Emperor's offer to slay his father for him. A deal of sorts was struck between the two. If Mortarion could take that Overlord down without the Emperor's help, Barbarus would be his, the Crusade would simply leave. But if not, the Imperium would absorb the feral world and Mortarion would bend his knee. The Death Guard of the time protested, but the bargain was made, and Mortarion set out to claim his home or die in the attempt. It quickly became apparent that the former option would certainly not be happening, as the Primarch barely made it to his father's home before collapsing due to the noxious air, but he was even denied the release of death as the Emperor intervened to prevent the Overlord striking him down. I assume the Emperor had followed at a safe distance, fully aware that Mortarion would fail, but not willing to lose his creation. The Lord of Mankind slew the last Overlord, and despite his clear bitterness at the situation, Mortarion honoured the deal and bent his knee. The 14th Legion were passed to him immediately, but the reunion was not exactly pleasant. His new sons gathered before their father, appearing as though he were the Grim Reaper himself from ancient Terran folklore with his former father's scythe known as Silence, and he spoke harshly but quietly to them all. He christened the 14th as his Death Guard, and the Dusk Raiders were no more. The new Death Guard were designed by Mortarion to be as flexible as possible. Every infantryman was trained to fill almost any role, and said role would often change from campaign to campaign as the Primarch deemed necessary. The 14th became dominated by its infantry, as Mortarion believed the Astartes themselves were the Legion's true strength, and it was noted later that there was a high proportion of Terrans amongst the tank crews. This is mainly due to the fact that the Death Guard weren't particularly keen on tanks, or Terrans. Not sure why though. The first engagement for the new Death Guard came against the tyrannical hive world Galaspar and summed up just what the new regime was all about. The battle was extremely one-sided. The primary hive fell within a day in a direct assault led personally by Mortarion and the remaining defenders were all slaughtered either in the toxic waste only the Death Guard could survive in or in their bastions turned death traps. Surrender was never considered by the Death Lord and by the time the Imperium arrived to take stock over 100 billion had been slain and the rest of Galaspar quickly fell into compliance just to be spared from the Reaper that had come for them. Such was the way it would be. No remorse. No steps taken backwards. Just conquest. The Death Guard never left garrisons, simply moving from war zone to war zone, leaving ruin in their wake. Despite the cultural and structural overhauls implemented by Mortarion, a few things did remain, however, and even prospered. For example, the endurance of the legionaries, already renowned, became somewhat legendary, and we've already noted they were just as relentless on campaign. This resilience saw the Death Guard deployed to the least hospitable of battlefields on many occasions, fighting on worlds that could not be integrated into the wider Imperium for various reasons. In these circumstances, the Death Guard were well known to use biological weapons such as the horrific Phosphex gas and rad shells. Many legions didn't use them as a point of honour as much as anything else, but the 14th had no such qualms and took great pleasure in unleashing weapons only they could hope to endure. It is said that the intended size for the Death Guard was 490,000 Astartes, as Mortarion designed the seven great companies to hold up to 70,000 warriors each. However, the attrition rate was still incredibly high despite the fortitude of the Legion, and so by the close of the Great Crusade, best estimates put the Death Guard a shade under 100,000 strong. Mortarion was known to keep his own counsel, and was not a particularly popular Primarch for obvious reasons perhaps. He and Vulcan fell out over their slightly variant methods of waging war, and it is known that Perturabo actively shunned the Death Lord. However, it is believed that if he had friends amongst his brothers, Horus and Conrad Kurz would be the nearest approximation. Despite this, Mortarion did not support Horus's elevation to Warmaster at Ulanor, predicting somewhat accurately that Interprimarch strife would surely follow, though I doubt he quite predicted what would come. 
He also had a bitter hatred of all things warp related, only becalmed about the existence of the Golden Throne, which he found out about by sneaking into the Imperial Palace, because of Malkador's insistence that it would remove the need for warp travel. The exact reasons for this hatred are unclear, though it's believed his adoptive father on Barbaris had been a sorcerer, which would help to clarify the issue if true. Though it cannot be said whether he was the first to call for it, Mortarians was one of the loudest anti psycho voices at the Council of Nicaea, openly accusing Magnus the Red and the Thousand Sons of sorcery. Late in the Great Crusade, the Death Guard and Mortarian, the Legion hardly divided and often fought as a cohesive whole, were either at the side of Horus, or at least in close proximity to the 16th Legion, as they would be called in to aid with the repacification of Istvan III. It is said that Mortarian was the hardest of all the Primarchs for Horus to corrupt, despite the fact that he and the Emperor had never exactly gotten on in the first place. This speaks volumes as to Mortarian's mindset and loyalty. Power held no appeal, chaos itself had no true sway over him, and even the grudge he likely held for Barbarous his forced integration was not enough to turn him against his father. What it apparently took was the knowledge of the Primarchs themselves. Horus had learned of the warp magic used to create the Primarchs, and when he told Mortarian, the Death Lord came to regard the Emperor as both a power-hungry tyrant and probably a bit of a hypocrite. Whatever he thought exactly, the result was clear, and Mortarian allied himself with Horus. On Istvan III, around one-third of the Death Guard were sacrificed, with most if not all of the Loyalist contingent being Terran. The Barbarous group almost worshipped Mortarian for saving their world, so almost entirely turned traitor with him. As the Death Guard were of course incredibly resilient, and thanks to the warning of Sol Tarvitz, many survived the virus bombing, forcing a costly ground invasion that Mortarian himself joined. On Istvan V, the Death Guard initially fought the Salamanders, before joining the counterattack on the Iron Hands when the drop site massacre began in earnest. Following this victory, the Death Guard were fully divided perhaps the first time into two separate fleets, with Mortarian leading one and First Captain Callus Typhon leading the other. The path this splinter took is unclear, though they are known to have fought the Dark Angels repeatedly, but Mortarian's contingent is known to have travelled to Prospero following the scouring of the Thousand Sons homeworld. There they met the White Scars and Jagtai Khan, and after a, a discussion slash attempted conversion of the Khan turned sour, the lesser known Second Battle of Prospero broke out. The battle was short and mostly fought in space, with the Death Guard withdrawing quickly after a coup within the Scars fleet was put down and Mortarian was nearly killed by the suicidal Sagyar Mazan and an exploding flagship, but they purged the Prospero system entirely on their way out. From there, it appears that Mortarian rejoined Horus's forces, accompanying him in both the battles on Dwell and Molek, before being sent back after the White Scars alongside Eidolon of the Emperor's Children. They failed to prevent the Khan from reaching Terra via the webway during the Battle of the Catalus Rift, and Mortarian subsequently ordered Eidolon to find the rest of his legion to reunify the Death Guard. However, it appears this operation was not a total success, as a small Death Guard force tried, and failed, to invade the Salamander's homeworld of Nocturne, whilst the 18th were returning the fallen body of Vulcan to be healed. One assumes that the reunion came late in the heresy, as Catalus took place only three years before the end, and it will have taken time to coordinate, and so there are no Death Guard engagements involving the reunited Legion before Terra itself. However, it was during the journey to the Cradle of Humanity that Chaos finally decided to have its way with the 14th Legion. Though Mortarian had become more tolerant of the warp and sorcery, perhaps even wielding it for himself on occasion, it is said he only did it in order to learn from and eventually become master of the arcane arts and the warp. It is fortunate he had taken this slightly less hardline view, as he was forced to rely on the formerly repressed psyker Typhon to navigate to Terra, the first captain had slain the Legion's navigators, claiming they were still loyal to the Emperor. This, unfortunately for Mortarian, and probably everyone else in the galaxy, cost the Death Guard dearly, as Typhon was already a servant of the Chaos God Nurgle and delivered his Legion straight into the clutches of the Plague Father. Becalmed in the warp, the 14th fleet was infected with the most virulent of Nurgle's plagues, but their incredible endurance meant that the legionaries refused to die despite their agony. The greatest strengths turned against them in what became a running trend for the traitor legions if you look at the Emperor's Children, the World Eaters, the list goes on. Mortarian himself was hit with a wave of deja vu, feeling like he was back in the mountains on Barbarus before the Emperor saved him, only this time there was no help, only death. Desperate to survive, Mortarian swore allegiance to Nurgle and Chaos, and the Death Guard were irrevocably changed. Sorry, words. They were not cured, 
but they were now seemingly immune to their sufferings, their bloated bodies barely contained in their warped armour, and their weaponry corrupted by Nurgle. The proud Death Guard, grim and relentless as they may have been, were no more save in name. In their place stood the Plague Marines, even tougher and more horrifying than the Legion had ever been or could ever have hoped to be. The new and improved Death Guard were entirely committed to the Battle of Terror, the corrupted Mortarian at their head. He wasn't a demon prince yet, though, despite Nurgle's blessings. Exactly where the Death Guard fought is unclear, but they were known to be involved in storming the breach caused by the Titan Legio Mortis. Unfortunately, they and the other traitors ran straight into Dawn and Sanguinius, so you can guess how that ended. Eventually, as the siege of the Imperial Palace continued, the 14th were pulled away from the walls, as the White Scars had begun conducting hit-and-run raids behind enemy lines that were becoming both an annoyance and a disruption of Horus's plans. When Horus fell at the hands of the Emperor, Mortarion led the Death Guard in a well-ordered retreat from Terra toward the Eye of Terra, but it is known that they left many worlds in ruin on their way to the warp. It is unknown to what degree they were caught up in the Great Scouring that followed the Heresy, but there were no Primarch fights that we know of, so we can assume the battles were either small or not particularly noteworthy compared to, well, at least compared to what else took place in that tumultuous time. Upon their arrival in the Eye, the Death Guard were rewarded with a world by Nurgle known as the Plague Planet. It is said that Mortarion reshaped the demon world in the image of Barbarus, and that he did such a magnificent job of it that Nurgle saw fit to finally elevate him to a demon prince. The Death Guard as a whole still reside there, largely separate from the main population that pray to the Plague Father to cure them of the ills that rack them. Unlike many traitor forces, the 14th Legion are, for the most part, still unified, though elements have splintered off over time as Mortarion's attention has turned more and more toward the affairs of the warp. When your tower is accessible through Nurgle's garden, it's perhaps a little surprise that the Primarch got a bit distracted. That's not to say the Death Lord has been ignorant in the material realm. He's been recording as manifesting at least twice in the past 10 millennia. I know that doesn't sound like much. For a Demon Primarch, that's at least average, given what it takes to summon one. The most recent return actually didn't go as well as planned. Mortarion successfully slew the Supreme Grandmaster of the Grey Knights, but was hunted down by his successor, Kaldor Drago, who carved his name onto the Primarch's heart after speaking his true name, i.e. the one the Emperor had chosen slash planned for, not Mortarion. Just for the record, it's not that easy to beat him. With the return of Robert Gilliman and Magnus the Red in recent times, it is plausible that Mortarion will return too. He's certainly been paying attention, unleashing deadly plagues across Ultramar in an attempt to distract his resurrected brother. As for his legion, the Death Guard still fight in a manner similar to their crusade days. Infantry-heavy assaults are still the order of the day. Rather than use the chemical weapons they once wielded, it is now common for Nurgle's gifts to be unleashed by the former 14th, with predictably horrifying results. They are still remorseless, but they have not forgotten what caused their rebirth as plague marines. Weakness was always seen as a flaw by the legion, though it became despised during the heresy, and their surrender to Nurgle caused the Death Guard to hate themselves for submitting to their own weaknesses. Some say this is why they cause as much ruin as they do, not only to spread the gifts of their new patron, but also to alleviate the shame of their failure to endure. Whatever the case, the coming of the Death Guard to a world often signifies that said world is either doomed to die in the most horrifying of ways, or will suffer hugely in attempting to repulse their invaders. In some cases, such as on the world of Orath, even death is no release for those unfortunate souls, as they can be reborn as plague zombies intent on wiping out their former friends and family for the Plague Father's amusement. Many old names from the Death Guard have lived on in either glory or infamy, and with the tale of the Legion told, we shall now explore a few of these legendary tales from the 14th. The first captain of the 14th Legion was unsurprisingly barbarous born, even though some sources suggest he had been part of the Dusk Raiders, which is in conflict with this. He was Callus Typhon, a psyker of some power who supposedly shared blood with the warlords of old Barbarous. This seems unlikely, but what have you. When he joined the Legion, he was forced to suppress the abilities he had spent his childhood mastering, due to his new lord's hatred of all things sorcerous. Resolving to prove himself without his psychic powers, he became renowned as the toughest of all in the toxin trials and endurance tests that were apparently implemented within the Death Guard, rising to become Mortarion's second. Typhon was probably the first Death Guard to be seduced by Chaos, with the Catalyst being Erebus of the Wordbearers some time before Horus's corruption on Davin. Once the Primarch and everybody else was ready to betray, though I doubt Typhon played much role in the fall of Mortarion due to Chaos holding no appeal that like we discussed before, 
the first captain helped to oversee the virus bombing of Istvan III. His flagship, the Terminus Est, was forced to break orbit and pursue the fleeing loyalists aboard the Eisenstein, more on them later, and though he inflicted grievous damage to the frigate, Typhon could not prevent the escape. Following the dropsite massacre, Typhon was given command of around half the Legion, though it is said his contingent was potentially larger than Mortarian's. Whether he had a specific task dictated to him is unclear, but it is known his forces clashed regularly with Lionel Johnson and the Dark Angels Legion. During one of these battles in the Perdita system, Typhon attempted to acquire a device known as the Chachulcha engine. Sorry, I probably butchered that pronunciation. This sentient device of probable warp origin was part of a trio that could create bridges across space and time if combined. And though Typhon's plans for it are unknown, he wished to get his hands on it for the benefit of his new master Nurgle, but was denied by the First Legion. This Death Guard fleet also supposedly met with Luther and who would become the Fallen Angels, but what they discussed or did is unknown. Eventually, the Death Lord called for his legion to reform, with the first captain probably being found by Lord Commander Eidolon. With his loyalty to Mortarion already less than his allegiance to the Ruinous Powers, what Typhon would do toward the end of the heresy is perhaps no surprise. Having killed the navigators of the legion, he led the fleets into the becalmed area of warp space where they were set upon by Nurgle's plagues. As the Death Guard either died or became corrupted, Typhon welcomed the gifts of his lord and became the host of the Destroyer Plague that had ravaged his brothers. Callus Typhon was no more, and in his place was Typhus, Herald of Nurgle. Typhus remained with the Legion up until the Plague Planet was colonised, but it is said he grew frustrated that the wars against the Imperium were seemingly on hold. He gathered together a like-minded force and set out at the head of probably the largest Plague Fleet in the galaxy, the corrupted Terminus Est at the head. He has even fought within the Garden of Nurgle itself, defending it from Cornate Assault and gaining a brief audience with Nurgle in his manse, and in more recent times he became the host slash catalyst for the zombie plague that has ravaged many Imperial worlds. Armed with his demonically possessed Scythe Man Reaper, believed to have been dipped in the overspill from Nurgle's virulent cauldron, Typhus will not stop his relentless crusades until the galaxy is under the effects of the Plague Father's works. Though Callus Typhon is arguably the most famous traitor death guard besides Mortarion himself, there is one loyalist member of the 14th who's arguably just as important in his own way. Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow was a Terran, but despite not being a barbarous native, he was still placed in command of the 7th and last Great Company. By the way, if you hadn't noticed, there's a huge prevalence of multiples of 7, Nurgle's sacred number, even in the Crusade era death guard. Just maybe need to go back and just keep track of how many there are. Garrow was somewhat distant from the other commanders of the 14th due to his heritage, which is from Albia, not Albania, as I think I said in the past. But despite their mockery, he remained determined to do his best to serve the Emperor. Of course, this faith in the Lord of Mankind would prove to be a rather big issue when the Horus Heresy broke out, and even in a one-to-one -one meeting with Garrow after the Battle of Iota Horlogi, Mortarion failed to make a dent in swaying his captain. This meant that Garrow was originally intended to die on Istvan III, but an injury on the further flung Istvan extremist meant he lost his leg and so was declared unfit for combat. He was saved by Fabius Bile and had a prosthetic fitted once he was back in the fleet. As a counter to his probable loyalty, Garrow was deployed alongside the traitorous second captain Ignatius Grulgor, who was under orders from Typhon to kill the seventh captain if necessary aboard the frigate the Eisenstein. As it happened, this intervention was necessary for two reasons. Garrow's apothecary discovered virus bombs aboard, which the Eisenstein was not allowed to carry under normal circumstances, and Garrow's sworn honour brother Saul Tarbitz of the Emperor's children sent a warning as the captain descended to warn the loyalists on the surface of the incoming bombardment. Realising what was happening, Garrow attempted to pull away from Istvan III citing a mechanical fault, but was forced to fight off Grulgor and the other traitors aboard the Eisenstein, only succeeding when the life eater canisters leaped into the cargo hold and Garrow sealed them inside. Once their betrayal was revealed, quote unquote, the Eisenstein tried to flee the system and did so, though it took severe damage from the Terminus Est before entering the warp. Nurgle was then able to reach the fallen warriors in the cargo hold, resurrecting them as the first of the Plague Marines, and though they were nigh unstoppable in the Immaterium, the connection to the Plague Father was rather tenuous. Garrow realised this and ordered the warp engines to be overloaded and jettisoned, causing the Eisenstein to re-enter the material realm and thus cut the connection to Nurgle, killing Grulgor and co again, though the second captain would later return as a demon prince. The explosion drew the attention of Rogel Dawn, who rescued Garrow and his crew that included the Acton crews of the Lunar Wolves before bringing them to the Sol system and imprisoning them on Luna after they delivered their warning. From then, Garrow was visited by Malkador the Sigilite, and along with Cruz and the sister of Silence Amandera Kendel, who had praised Garrow to Mortarion on Iota Horlogi, 
he became something of a forerunner to the Inquisition. Jarrow was stripped of his Death Guard iconography and became the first of the Knights Errant, sent out by Malkador to recruit more agents. His journey was long and saw him recruit individuals such as Tylos Rubio, Mesa Varen and Garviel Loken, who we've discussed earlier in this series. Jarrow's final fate, however, is somewhat of a mystery. We know he returned to Terra with the remaining knights just before the Grey Knights were founded, but as he was not psychic himself, he cannot have been a founder of that chapter like Rubio was. I assume he became a member or agent of the Inquisition in some capacity, assuming he lived, but there is no evidence to support any hypothesis. If you do wish to know more about either Kalas Typhon or Garrow, then I've made vid logs on them in the past, and we looked into Grulgor in a bit more detail when we discussed the Demon Princes. Both Mortarion and Kalas Typhon had unique Terminator armoured warriors in their service, acting as bodyguards in the former case and specialised warriors in the other. For Mortarion, there was the Death Shroud, an unknown number of warriors hand-picked for the role. No one knew who they were, pretty much, as they were listed as killed in action and never removed their helms under any circumstance. Often formed from sole survivors of wiped out squads who had proven their bravery and endurance as much as their fighting ability, the Death Shroud were armed with the power sights unique to the 14th Legion. These weapons were known as Man Reapers, suggesting they have the same origin as the weapon Typhus wields today. This is highly likely, as these sights were sometimes wielded by high-ranking officers as well. While Tyrion was always attended by at least two members of the Death Guard, who always remained within 49 paces of their Primarch, or multiples of seven for those keeping track. The exact number of Death Shroud is unclear, but we know on Molech that Mortarion killed all seven of them to feed the demonic essence of Indacious Grulgor. I feel, however, that having only seven bodyguards in total is a bit of a small number for a Primarch. Interestingly, unlike many Primarch Honor Guards, the Death Shroud still exist today, as they were part of Mortarion's army when they fought the Grey Knights in M41. As far as we know, Kalas Typhon and the other captains do not have members of the Death Shroud accompanying them, but instead the first captain had the Grave Wardens. This started out as a nickname for all Terminators under Typhon's command, but as time passed, the Grave Wardens became a dedicated fighting force in themselves. They were unique in that they were armed almost exclusively with chemical weapons. Their modified Astartes grenade launchers were capable of firing Phosphex bombs, and they were constantly emitting poisonous gases known collectively as the Death Cloud. This made them highly effective at cleansing a world of life, even if such a world would likely be in ruin for decades afterwards without a hope of colonisation. It also meant that the Grave Wardens were utterly lethal during the Heresy, as only the Death Guard had fortitude enough to withstand their toxic onslaught for long. Their captain was Hadrabulus Vios, who also filled the role of Typhon second in command in the First Great Company. Whilst we do not know of Vios' actions specifically during the Heresy, we can assume he was part of Typhon's fleet that caused such problems for the Dark Angels. In fact, Vios had fought alongside the First Legion in the Crusade, as Luther and his forces joined the Death Guard and what was still known at the time as the Lunar Wolves in the Zaramund campaign, which would have been a footnote at best were it not for the fact that Lionel Johnson hadn't allowed Luther to be there in the first place and thus stripped him of his rank. Some say this was one of the catalysts toward the creation of the Fallen Angels, who of course would meet with Typhon's forces again during the Heresy. The Grave Wardens I assume no longer exist, for their purpose was rather invalidated given the power of Nurgle that would come to inhabit all of the Death Guard, but I suppose one could argue that these Terminators were perhaps, at a stretch, the earliest ancestors of the Plague Marines. As has become tradition, we shall conclude our look at the Death Guard by covering a few shorter but still noteworthy tales. We'll start with a pair of loyalists, Captain Ulis Temeta and the venerable dreadnought Huron Fal. Temeta was the captain of the 4th Great Company and potentially led the Death Guard ground forces during the initial invasion of Istvan III. When the virus bombing began, the captain received warning from a still loyal Lucius of the Emperor's children and ordered his men to reach a series of bunkers to weather the storm. Both he and Huron Fal made it, but Temeta refused to enter whilst his brothers were still outside, and the Dreadnought was in the process of bullying his captain into cover when the bombs fell. Huron Fal had initially told Temeta that he could survive outside anyway thanks to a Dreadnought armour in an effort to get the captain inside, but neither ended up getting in before Temeta ordered the bunkers sealed. This was a death sentence for the fourth captain, but as the Dreadnought gathered him closer, he realised that the armour was breached. Huron Fal had lied, and he would die too. Stating simply that his prerogative as a veteran was not to reveal that information, Huron Fowl chose to detonate his reactor and kill both himself and Temeta on their own terms. On the traitor side, we have the Siege Master, Grimus Calgara. A Marshal of the 14th and an alternate title for the Lord Commander, Calgara was promoted following the death of the fanatical Jurak Rask during the traitor attack on Istvan III, 
Rask was also a traitor, believing Mortarion to be a saviour for the events on Barbarus. He just got killed. Calgaro joined Mortarion's part of the Death Guard after Istvan V, and with Kalas Typhon leading the other contingents, the Marshal became the Primarch's effective second. During the Battle of Catalus against the White Scars, Calgaro led a good chunk of the Death Guard forces and is thought to have survived, but his fate following that engagement is unfortunately unknown. Finally for today, we have the commander Malig Leistigon. Apologies if I butchered that, I'm not going to say it again. Malig was the commander of a cruiser, Reaper's Shroud, and is known to have been part of the forces at Istvan V, presumably in the traitor fleet. However, for reasons unknown, he and his crew fell out of favour with Mortarion, and the Reaper's Shroud was seemingly abandoned by the rest of the Legion. Malig desperately wanted to get back into favour, and assumedly back into the fleets. And though we don't know all the details of this interim period, we know he got his best chance as the Salamanders attempted to return the body of Vulcan to Nocturne in its stasis chamber. The Death Guard tailed the force under First Captain Artilus Numian in the hopes of stealing Vulcan's body, and actually succeeded in launching an invasion of Nocturne itself after being denied of a virus bombing. But they were either killed or driven off. Malik's fate is unknown, so he may well have been killed on Nocturne, but as he was commander of the Reaper's Shroud and the vessels not classed as destroyed, he could have survived and escaped the Salamanders. So end the tales of the Death Guard Legion. The 14th were resilient in both body and mind, but this defining characteristic, like for so many other legions, was turned against them during the Horus Heresy and damned them to serve in chaos. I find it hard to feel sympathy for Mortarion and his sons, although their transformation to the Plague Marines was definitely not their fault, and yet I respect their mindset and dedication to the cause nonetheless. Sure, their methods were abhorrent at times, and some of the internal affairs were a little harsh as well but they performed a great service to the Imperium, both as Dusk Raiders and Death Guard. For now though, it is time to move on. Next time, I don't intend to tell any stories of individuals, groups, or even of a notable war. Rather, I wish to explore something a little more scientific, looking at the biology and engineering that goes into making some of the most potent warriors function. So join me if you wish next time, where we'll be exploring Gene Seed, Power Armor, and everything else that goes into making a Space Marine. I hope you've enjoyed this 13th part of our Legions mini-series and that you'll be with us for the remaining few. Thank you all for watching, my name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.